All right, John chapter number eight, another long chapter. We've got so much to get to. I'm going to have to, but for reason of time, just skip over some of these things. But we start off in the beginning of this chapter with a very famous story. It's this famous passage of the, the woman taken in adultery, right? And it's kind of funny because you talk to people who don't know the Bible very well, and they always refer to this woman as the woman at the well. <laughs> and I've had this conversation so many times with people that say, oh, well, what about the woman at the well? You know, Jesus said, the, you know, he that was without sin cast the first stone at her. Like, two different stories. Okay, the woman at the well was a woman that Jesus Christ got saved and she went and told other people, is not this the Christ? She had five husbands and the woman that she was with now wasn't her husband. That's the woman at the well. This is a different woman. Okay, just to make that clear. We'd, we're in John chapter 8, but that's always how you can tell when, when someone doesn't know their Bible very well at all. They just hear some, they just hear a little bit of preaching and they think they're going to tell you what the Bible says and everything else and it's like you don't even, you don't even have your story straight. But um, regardless of that, John chapter 8, let's, let's look at this story. We're going to read it again. We just read it, but we're going we're gonna to jump back to it. And it says, um, we're going to start reading in verse number 3. The Bible says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So they're bringing this woman to him that they say, like, we caught her in the middle of committing adultery. Like, this isn't just something that somebody said about her. It's not just an accusation. This woman is guilty. We caught her in the very act and they're bringing her to Jesus Christ. And they're doing this for a specific reason. Let's keep reading. It says, um, verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? And um, this, said they, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger on the ground as though he heard them not. So they bring this, this woman to say, look, Moses in the law said that she ought to be stoned to death because that was, and that is what the law says. Adulterers are, are worthy of the death penalty and they should be stoned to death. That is what the law of Moses says. They were right about that law. That, that is what it says. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to trick him. They're trying to tempt him. It, that's what it says in verse 6. This they said, tempting him. The word tempting means they're testing him. They're trying him and they're, they're doing it with malicious intent because they're trying to catch him up at his words. They're trying to get him to stumble. And um, this isn't the only time that Jesus was tempted with people that, that were trying to catch him in his words. If you remember in Matthew 22, I'll read it for you in verse 17. The Bible says, Tell us therefore what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? This is another question they brought up to Jesus Christ. Because what kind of answer? They're, basically, they're, they're asking him questions that there is no right answer to. They're trying to get him to say, well, if he says that, it's, you know, that they shouldn't pay their taxes to Caesar, you know, then, of course, they're going to report him to Caesar and say, hey, this guy's telling us not to pay our taxes. They're going to get him arrested. They're going to get him thrown in jail. And they're going to get him punished you know, in, in the human government speaking. But then they're going to say, like, well, if he says that we should give money unto Caesar, then they're going to say, well, what about God? Right? So they're, they're, they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to trick him with these questions. But Jesus is obviously way wiser than they are, way smarter. And that's why he says, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? He knew it. And then he says, You know, bring me a piece of money. He says, Who image and superscription is this? And he says, Caesar. So render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, render unto God that which is God's. So he doesn't really answer them saying, Should we pay taxes? He doesn't answer the question. He just, he just says, Look, would give to Caesar that, that which belongs to Caesar and give to God that which belongs to God. There you go. There's your answer. And, and that way he doesn't, they don't have to, you know, he, they can't catch him saying something that's going to just get him thrown in jail or something. And honestly, like, I, don't, I, I really don't want to get into this subject because there's so much in John chapter 8. But I could totally understand why people don't want to pay their taxes these days with the wicked government that we have and the wicked programs that they fund and everything else that is going on. And I've seen the evidence that shows like, like we're not even supposed to be paying an income tax. It's supposed to be a voluntary-based system and all this other stuff. Look, I get it. But there is still a threat of force of you're going to go to jail if you decide not to pay your taxes. And, and amen for the people that want to fight that battle. 
I'm all for that. But I, to me, I kind of look at it as just like, it's money here. You can have your stinking money. You know, the, the, the streets are going to be paved with gold in heaven. God doesn't care about money. I don't care about money. It's not my main focus. Look, if, if you know, people are going to rob me, the government's going to rob me blind. Am I happy about it? No. Am I going to pay as little as possible? Yes, you better believe it. But to me, it's not worth it to fight so far to go to prison over. And that's where I stand on that. I'm, I'm not for the tax aid. I'm not for any of that stuff. But if it's, if it's at the threat of violence, of, of people coming to my house and, and dragging me away and putting me in a cage somewhere for a while, then they could have their stinking money. And that's where I, I kind of take this as, hey, I'm going to render unto Caesar whatever. The things that are Caesar. But anyways, I, I only bring this up. I don't want, I, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. The reason I even brought up this reference is because there are people that are trying to trip Jesus up in his words. They're trying to catch him. They're trying to get something to accuse him of. They're trying to get him in trouble. They're trying to, you know, these people want him arrested. They want to kill him. And they're trying to trip him up. So this isn't the first time this happened. But let's go back and I'm going to explain, well, how could they be tripping him up in his words, right? I mean, we know that Moses' law says that they're guilty. You know, they, they should be stoned to death, right? They were right in saying that. So why couldn't Jesus just say, yep, you know, go ahead and kill. We're going to see why. In the example um, with the woman, turn if you would to John chapter 18. Because we're going to see how they were trying to trip him up. How were they going to be able to accuse him of if he were just to say, well, that's what Moses' law says, so yes, you know, stone her to death. John chapter 18, look at verse number 31. The Bible reads, Then said Pilate unto them, this is when Jesus was being tried, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. That's what he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Pharisees. It was the Jewish law. See, at that time, you understand, they're under Roman control. They were in the, you know, under the Roman Empire. They had, the Jews had their own like um, governors and things where, where they, can, they had a certain amount of power among themselves, over themselves, to, to judge and to, and to you know, execute some kind of judgment on people. But look what it says here in John 18, 31. It says, The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. They did not, they were not allowed by the Roman government to have that power to execute people. They were not given that power by that government at that time. They said, okay, you know, you can take care of some of these matters, you know, what, and I don't know all the details and specifics about it, but we can see clearly here that it was not lawful for the Jews to put anyone to death, which is why they're trying to tempt Jesus and to test him here for him to say she needs to be put to death because what are they going to do? Now they're going to accuse him to the Roman government and say, look, this guy said he's usurping your authority, your government authority, that, that you know, he's saying she should be put to death. And that's how they're going to try to get him arrested, try to get him in trouble. So Jesus need, is, again, he answers very wisely. And unfortunately, I think that this story gets, gets misinterpreted too often because people don't understand what they're trying to do and why he answers the way he does. Now, Jesus is not a deceiver. He's not deceptive at all. And he's not trying to lie. He's just being wise and choosing his words carefully. Look at what he answers them. It says in John chapter 8, just flip back to John chapter 8 if you're not there yet. We're in, we're in verse number 7. Because at first he just ignores them. At first he's riding on the ground, just pretends like he doesn't hear them. You know, they bring this woman out and they're, you know, we caught her in the very act. You know, she was committing adultery. Moses said that we need to stone her death. What do you say? And he's just ignoring him. He's just writing on the ground, just pretending not to hear him at all. But they keep pestering him, bothering him. So verse number seven, it says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. That's his whole answer. That's what Jesus said. That is, that is Jesus' answer on this issue to all those people that were trying to, you know, to ask him what should be done. Now, did he say she shouldn't be put to death? Is that what he said? He didn't say that. He didn't say, he didn't go against Moses' law and say she shouldn't be put to death. He never said that one time. Yet that is what people will teach and preach. Say, oh, well, see, Jesus got rid of the law. That's Old Testament. Jesus came and made all things new and we're under grace. So none of that matters anymore. False. What Jesus did was he answered in a way where 
he's not going to get in trouble either way. He said something that was true and right, and that's not going to get him arrested and thrown in jail at the same time. He was able to, to answer the question appropriately and say, hey, okay, you know, he that is without sin among you cast the first stone. Now look, there is also another, you know, there is more meaning to this as well. But we got to understand that primary surface meaning of what they're trying to do to him and why he answers the way he does. Now, when Jesus came to this earth, the first time when Jesus came, like he did here, did he come to judge the world? Nope. No. He came as a servant. He came to minister. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. That was his purpose. That was his goal. He didn't come to reign and to be the king and to rule with a rod of iron. He didn't do that. He's coming back to do that in the future. He will come and he will be the judge. When he comes back, he's going to be angry at the world, at the wickedness, and they will get judged. So yes, the adulterers, the fornicators, that you know, all the wicked people, they're going to get judged when Jesus comes back again. But when Jesus was here the first time, that was not his goal, that was not his mission. He came so that the world through him might be saved. So he did not come to condemn any individual person. That's not why he was sent. He was doing his Father's will. So this is also the reason why he answered the way he did. He wasn't here just to judge her and say, yes, she needs to be with the death because he came to give her salvation. He, gave, he came to bring the mercy and, and to bring the forgiveness and, and to be forgiveness for, for all that call upon him. That is why he was here. God is not just the God of judgment. He's also the God of mercy. But God is also not just the God of mercy. He is also the God of judgment. You can't have one without the other. And people tend to focus too much and, and I think take this too far, the one direction of the mercy into just, just using this example of just saying, see, the law doesn't matter. No, that's not true. And Jesus didn't say the law doesn't matter. He just said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone at her. He was bringing to, to mind, hey, look, you're not perfect either. If you're going to be, you know, because what were they doing? I mean, they were, they were just saying, oh, man, this woman, she's a wicked, she's good, you know, like, and just, and just, just um, trying to get her put to death. And Jesus said, well, what? think about yourself for a minute. And these people that were accusing Jesus, they were not righteous people. Okay, these were not the godly people. These are the people that hated Jesus that wanted him to be put to death. These, a lot of these people are false prophets. They're the Pharisees. They're the people that, that wanted to just get Jesus shut up and put in jail. They're the people that hate God. They had plenty of their own wickedness that they're bringing up this, this woman in front of Jesus and, and accusing her. So we see here, and this is, this is really interesting too. Let's keep reading. Verse 8 says, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So he just keeps doing back what he's doing. He's, he was ignoring him at first. He's writing on the ground. Now listen to what he say. They finally keep asking him. So he stands up and says, okay, look, he that's without sin, cast the first stone. And he goes back down to what he was doing. Just goes back to writing on the ground. And he's just like, whatever. Verse number 9, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So basically what happens is that, you know, the oldest person there realizes, well, I'm not without sin. You know, that the old, longer you live on this earth, the more you realize you're a sinner, right? That you tend to have a lot more pride and in, 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 um, think you're so great when you're younger, young man, you know, you've, everything's going for you. You get older, you live through this life longer, you start to realize, you know what, I'm, <laughs> I'm really not that good. And, uh, so at the eldest, they, they start realizing this. And it says they were convicted by their own conscience. Now, I want to draw a little bit of attention to this because, again, there's, there's an imbalance with preaching on how people get saved. And people like to focus. There, there's a certain group out there that, that, will, that, that really try to drive home this um, people being convicted of their sins, like the lost, that you have to just continually just expose how wicked and how, how horrible they are and how, what a bad person they are and all these things to just break them down so that they could get saved. And I don't believe that. Okay, now look. Do we have to understand that we are sinners? Yes. Do we have to understand that there is a punishment for our sins and that punishment is hell? 
Yes. If we don't understand that, then what do we need to be saved from? People need to get that and understand that. But I don't think that every person you talk to just needs to be just, just go over and over and over just how horrible of a person they are. I don't think that's necessary. I don't think you have to just bring people down so low in order for them to receive salvation. Look, it's easy to understand that we're sinners. We get it. I, you know, no one had to no one had to berate me or, or really just bring me down to show to for me to understand that God's word says that I'm a sinner and that I deserve hell. It's pretty easy to get that concept. Not maybe not for everybody, but but by and large, you know, you don't need this overwhelming emotional experience of feeling like the lowest worm on the earth before you can call on God and get saved. That's simply not true. Now, for some people, maybe they do have an experience like that. Okay, great. Amen. I'm glad you got saved. And, and you know what? Some people go through things like that and they're brought really low. Or maybe they even hear you know, a lot of things that... that they didn't realize that they're sins, and now they know that. But people over and over again, they, they kind of buy into this. Well, the Holy Spirit's got to convict you, and the Holy Spirit's got to convict you that you've done wrong. Did you know that we just read the only time in the Bible that this word convict, convicted, conviction, any variation of the word convict is used in the Bible? It's right here. So if it's so important that people just have to undergo this conviction and everything else, and they have to realize how, how, how miserable and poor and depraved they are in God's sight, it's not, that's not, that doesn't exist as, as an overwhelming theme by any, re, by any means. Now, again, I want to be a little careful with my words because if someone does feel like that, okay, then and maybe they should, you know, if depending on what they're doing and stuff, and if that's what it needs for them to get to the point to, to be humble enough to accept the free gift, okay, so be it. But I'm just saying that this isn't something that everyone has to do because people will people will mock us for for, for going out and, and preaching the gospel the way we do because we don't spend a ton of time on the bad news. See, I like to spend a ton of time on the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I like to tell people how they can be saved. I want to tell them how, you know, what Jesus did for them, explain the whole gospel to them, explain eternal life, explain eternal security to them. They know they're sinners. We all inherently know that we've done wrong. We know that God is a God of judgment. We know these things. You don't need to be told just over and over and over again. Now, do I just overlook it? No. I go and we'll show them. I'll show them Revelation. I'll show them Revelation 21.8 and explain, look, it says all these sins, you know, murderers, whoremongers, uh, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake. Which I explain that. Look, hell is the punishment that you deserve. But I don't just go down this whole list and be like, have you ever looked at a woman and lust after her in your heart? Have you ever you know, stolen anything? Have you ever, you know, and just start, just start listing off all of their sins and just asking about all their sins. You don't need to do that. You know, and, and there's these people who want to preach the gospel that they focused all their time almost on the bad news and then they just whiz over the good news and that's it. No, I'm going to spend the majority of the time on the gospel. We know we're sinning. I mean, once a person understands that, hey, let's move on. We got that settled. Do you understand you're a sinner? You, you know God's a God of judgment and he'll punish you for your sins in hell? Do you get that? Do you understand that? Do you realize that? If they say yes, if they get it, move on, man. You know, there's no reason to keep on berating them because you think that somehow they need to be convicted. Look, they get it. They understand they need a Savior. That's the whole point. Um, it's not this, this, you know, this gospel that's all about this feeling of conviction. Again, this is the only place we see that. Now, who are the people in this, in this uh, chapter that are being convicted? These are people who aren't saved. It's the, it's the scribes and the Pharisees. Look, at, in verse number 3, we, kind of, we skipped over this verse, but it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. That's who brought this woman, and this is who Jesus was talking to, and that's who wanted to kill her and stone her with stones, was the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees did not believe on Jesus Christ. They believe in their false religion of Judaism. 
They were, they were Jews, but they did not believe on the Lord. They did not believe on Jesus Christ. They didn't believe God the Father. Jesus said, if you believe, if you believe the Father, you'd believe me. They didn't believe either of them. These are the people, and they got convicted. But, the, but look what else it says. It doesn't say they got convicted by the Holy Ghost. It says they got convicted by their own conscience. Their own conscience. Our own conscience will tell us that we're sinners. Did Jesus have to list off all of their sins? He said one thing. He just said, he that is without sin cast the first stone at her. That's all he had to say. And their own conscience tells them that they're sinners. We know this. And this is why we don't have to spend, you know, half an hour, an hour just explaining to someone how wicked and horrible they are. Jesus had to say one sentence and they got it. They understood that their own conscience will tell them that they're sinners. They know this. Their own conscience said that, and then they went out one by one. And look, did any of these people end up getting saved here? Not that we can see. Again, did they get convicted? Sure, they got convicted. They felt bad. They left. But nowhere do we see any of them calling on Jesus or turning around and, being, and saying they believe on him. I mean, who knows if they had got to say it or not. I don't know, but I'm just saying we, we don't see that from the chapter. But um, I just I wanted to point that out because it's it's gotten popular. There's, there's these false teachers like Ray Comfort who teach the way of the master, and he teaches a false doctrine of, of this. You have to repent of your sins and give up all of your sins and live a good life in order to be saved. It's a works-based salvation, and they're the type of people that really that do this and that focus in on how bad and how wicked people are. And this is why I'm preaching against it tonight. I just want to point that out that. If you're looking for a conviction in the Bible, it's right here in John 8. And go ahead and do a Bible study for it. That's what I did. I looked up all the times it's used, and here's where it's used. Right here. Let's keep reading in the chapter. Verse number 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, Go and sin no more. So again, we see here, this is, the, this is the end of this story. You know, everybody leaves, so he says, okay, where's your accusers? Now remember, in order to be guilty, you had to have you know, at least like two witnesses. Jesus isn't going to condemn anybody, first of all, if it was, I mean, like, like everybody left. Her accusers, the people who wanted to accuse her, they're gone. So when it's, she's just left there alone now, and he says, okay, well, where are, those, where are your accusers at? They're gone. Well, for one, he's not going to convict her now of anything without having two or three witnesses there to condemn her. They're already gone. But not just that. Look what he says. He says, neither do I condemn thee. And again, I already brought this up. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came that the world through him might be saved. That's what it says in John 3.17. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For He sent not His Son into the world, that the world... Wow, I can't believe my brain is going on such a famous passage. For God sent not his son into the world that, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't send him to condemn the world, so Jesus didn't condemn this, this woman either. But look what he says here. He says, he says go and sin no more. Who can say to say like, like, oh, it's fine, go ahead. I mean, it's, commit adultery, we're free, we're under the law. We're, we're not under the law, we're under grace. No big deal. That's not the attitude he had, and that's what, that's what the fun centers today will tell you it is. That's what these, these liberal Christianity will tell you. Oh, we're under grace. It's no big deal. Just go ahead, and it doesn't matter what you do. God doesn't care about it anymore. You know, the law doesn't in an effect. That's not what Jesus said to her. He says, go and sin no more. Go, don't, you know, don't be living this lifestyle. Don't be getting yourself into trouble. Go and sin no more. But he didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn this world. He will come and judge one day, and it's coming soon. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Thou, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go. Um, let's, let's jump down to verse 19. I, don't, I, I have to skip this for sake of time. I have to skip something in this chapter. There's too much stuff to go over. Let's skip down to verse 19. There's a lot of great truth here. This is going to have to be a whole sermon in and of itself. Verse number 19 says, Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, 
Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. So, as I was just saying, you know, the Pharisees, did they believe in God? Did they know God? No. According to Jesus, they didn't. He says, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. If you know the Father, you know the Son. If you know the Son, you know the Father. Because they're one. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. You can't have one without the other. And a lot of people today will say, oh, the Jews... You know, they're just like Christians, except they don't believe in Jesus, but, they, but we both believe in God the Father. No, they don't. No, Judaism today does not believe in the Lord. They do not believe in Jehovah God. They do not believe in Him. They claim to believe in Him, as they did back here, but according to Jesus' words, He says, if you had known me, you'd know my Father also. They didn't know His Father. They didn't, they, they're not saved. They don't have faith in the Lord. They don't know him. This is just more proof. Let's keep reading. Verse number 20. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, we're going to get back to this at the end of the chapter. But remember what he says right here, verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. When he says that I am he, remember that. We're going to get back to that. Let's keep reading. Verse 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things that I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. Again, remember that phrase, I am he. It's going to come up again at the end of the sermon. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Now, I think I brought this up recently in another sermon, but I think it's amazing how Jesus says, I do always those things that please him. Who can say that? No man on this earth can say that statement, I do always those things that please him. Everything that Jesus Christ did, he was always pleasing in God's sight. Why? Because he was without sin. He never did anything wrong. And not only did he never just not sin, he did all kinds of work for God. Everything that God had laid out for him to do, he did it. Everything. And that's why he said when he was dying on the cross, it is finished. Because he finished all of the work that God had laid out for him to do, which is why he wasn't arrested here. And there it says that, that his hour was not yet come. Why was his hour not yet come? Because he had more work to do. God protected him. God watched over him until he finished his work. All of the work that Jesus needed, needed to do, all of the prophecies he needed to fulfill, all the people he healed, all the miracles he performed, every, all the work that he did was pleasing to God because he did it all. He did everything. And it's just amazing that, I mean, here's a man, again, I've said this over and over again, but you, you cannot say that Jesus was, was a good teacher and was a man of God without believing that he is a deity, that he is God in the flesh. You cannot say that he's not God in the flesh, but he is a good teacher. Based on all the statements we've already seen in the book, we're only in chapter number eight and the words of Jesus' own mouth. To say that for I do always those things that please him, any normal man, that would be a lie. But it wasn't for Jesus Christ. And to say, if you don't believe that he was perfect, that he was sinless, that he was God in the flesh, then you'd have to say that he was a liar by saying something like this. Let's keep reading. Verse number 30. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, 
According to this, it says, at first it says that many believed on him, right? So they're saved. The people that believed on Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, they're saved because that's all we have to do for salvation. But what does he say to them? In order to be his disciples, what do they have to do? They have to continue in his word. They have to, to do the works. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples that followed him. They didn't just sit at home and just get saved and believe and, and, and then go and do nothing. No, his disciples are ones that follow him. And I'm pointing this out because, you know, not everybody that's saved is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Those who decide to, to, to you know, live right and, and, and study and learn and obey and do more works for Christ, those are his disciples. Those that keep his word are his disciples. You could get saved... And you are saved, your soul is saved because you put your faith in Christ. But it doesn't make you a disciple. A disciple is someone who follows and learns and, and walks the walk, so to speak. You know, not just, not just putting their faith in salvation. Salvation comes from no works at all. Being a disciple does require works. It does involve following. And um, I just wanted to clear that up. But look at the next verse. It's in verse 32. It says, And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. So by becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, by continuing in the word, this is how you're going to know the truth. It's going to come by doing. It's not just going to come by studying. You have, to, you have to continue in the word. You have to be a disciple of Christ in order to receive this extra knowledge and to gain that truth and to gain that wisdom. And then he says, and the truth shall make you free. And this is misquoted. If, you know, people often say the truth will set you free. That's what it says in the New Versions. King James Bible says the truth shall make you free. It's going to make you free. It doesn't just set you free. It makes you free. And he says in verse 33, they answered him. And see, of course, they don't understand. It says, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, they start saying, well, look, what do you mean we're going to be made free? You know, we're going to know the truth and the truth is going to make us free. We're, we're already free. And we could say that today, you know, in America. Well, we're already free. We live in a free country. You know, I'm not a slave to anybody. I'm a free man. And this is basically what they were saying is that, you know, we're children of Abraham. You know, we're not, we're not in bondage to anyone. We're not slaves to anybody. We're free. But Jesus says, no, when you do sin... When you get caught up in sin, you become a servant to that sin. That, that sin brings you into bondage. Now, and this is what we were just talking about a little bit earlier, Sebastian, right? We're done the soul winning. How we are at liberty when you get saved. You are free from the curse of the law. There's a curse of the law that requires us to pay for our sins in hell. When you get saved, you are free from that curse. But because we have free will, because we still have this flesh, as a saved individual, we can still sin. We can still get into sin, and we can still get under the bondage of sin. Okay, any saved person today has a choice. Let's say they decide to, you know, or maybe they, they never quit or whatever. They become an alcoholic. I mean, I have the choice, do I not, as, a, as, a, as an individual, you know, I'm, I, my soul is saved because I put my faith in Christ. But if I wanted to, I could go down to the liquor store and just, and just buy some booze and, and become a drunk. Now, if I were to do that, I'd become an alcoholic, I'd be in bondage to that booze. I'd be in bondage to that sin. That sin would have dominion over me. Or it say not even drinking, but just start smoking, right? It, it brings people into bondage. It brings you under control. It, it's, you know, most people who smoke these days, they don't want to keep smoking. But they're under bondage. Now, does that mean they're not saved? No, of course not. Salvation comes just by putting your faith in Christ. But when you get into sin, it's going to bring you into bondage. It doesn't matter whether that sin is pornography, whether it's smoking, drinking, whatever, whatever it may be. Fornication is going to bring you into bondage. And see, people start off just, just dipping their toe in that water of sin. And testing out the waters a little bit. Wow. And that's how you get started. You say, oh, I'm just going to do a little bit. And you back off. And, oh, I kind of like that. Oh, I'm gonna go. And you start going a little bit further and further. Before you know it, you're plunged right in. And you don't even realize how you got to that point. And you try to get out. And now all of a sudden, you're in bondage to that sin. And this is what he's talking about. Hey, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, 
You're gonna, for one, you're going to know the truth. You'll be walking in the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you decide to start following Christ, okay, great, you're saved. That's the first step. But if you're going to start following Christ and living according to His Word, hey, He'll free you. He'll make you free from the sins that you have. The sins that you have in your life that you think are bringing you into bondage, you're struggling with alcohol, you're struggling with sin, you're struggling with any, whatever sins there is that keep you under bondage. Hey, become a disciple of Jesus Christ, follow His Word. He'll make you free from that bondage. He'll help you to purge that sin out of your life. God has the power to help you to get through these things, to overcome that sin and that bondage in your life. But it's going to require you to continue in His Word. You're going to have to be steadfast. You're going to have to, to, to keep up with it. You're going to have to, to be His disciple. You're going to have to try to follow Jesus and do the things that He would do and do, you know, and do the things that He wants you to do and, and really get involved and get focused on serving Him and being His disciple in order for you to know the truth and for the truth to make you free, to make you free from that bondage. And that's what He's explaining to them here, that you're in a bondage of sin. Let's keep reading. He says... Um, in verse 37, because they, 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 they answered him and said, we're, you know, we're Abraham's seed, so we weren't in bondage to any man. He says in verse 37, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. So right off the bat, he's saying, look, I know you're Abraham's seed physically. I know you're descended from Abraham, but that's not what I'm talking about. He says, you're going about to kill me. Abraham wouldn't do that. You know, he's basically saying, hey, if you're Abraham's son, you'd be doing the works of Abraham. I mean, if you were really calling yourself a son of Abraham, then you're going to be just like your daddy. You're going to be doing the things that he would be doing. But you're not, you're not a son of your father. Even though physically you may have the same genes as your father, you're not of your father. You're not of, of Abraham. You're not of that physical father. Because you'd be like him if you were really of him. He says that, um, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. So now he's alluding that they have another father, and it's not Abraham. Verse number 39 says, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. It only makes sense, right? Verse 40, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Abraham didn't try to kill the people that, that told him the truth. He's saying, I'm telling you the truth. I've heard this from God, from my father, and I'm relaying the truth to you, and you're try trying to kill me because I'm telling you the truth. He said, Abraham didn't do that. And then he, he, he says again in verse 41, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So now they're claiming that God is our father. First they were saying Abraham. Now they're saying God's our father. Verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. I'm going to stop right here. This is a very, very important passage to, uh, that's used to support a doctrine that we believe of people who become reprobate. These people, there are certain of the Pharisees and the scribes that, uh, like I said, the ones that hated Jesus, that wanted to see him killed, that went to all lengths to get him shut up, that were reprobate. And Jesus is saying right here that they were of their father, the devil. Now, if God is your father... You are born again, right? In John chapter 1, he explains, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when we're saved, when we put our faith in Christ, we become a son of God. Now, my children, they're my daughters, right? I have three daughters. They're daughters of me, of David Burson's. They are always my daughters. No one else can ever be their father now except for God when they're spiritually born again, right? But physically, 
when they're born, so they have one dad. And no one else could come along and then all of a sudden be their dad, be their father. They have one. When we're spiritually born again, God becomes our father. There's no one else that can become our father after that. We can't lose our salvation. We have eternal life. And God is our father and he is our father forever. He be, we become his child. That's a permanent thing. That's something that lasts one time. Now when Jesus is saying that these people are children of the devil, it's the same thing. Once you become a spiritual child, because they weren't physical children of the devil, Jesus already said, I know that you're Abraham's seed. They were physically descended from Abraham. They weren't physically descended from the devil. They were spiritually the devil's children. So the same way that we can't lose our salvation because we're children of God, these people can't be saved because they're children of of the devil. They have made that choice in their life. God, you know, it doesn't mean that they never had an opportunity. No, no, of course, they had opportunity. Hey, Jesus brought them the truth and they didn't believe it. They rejected it and they became reprobate. They became rejected by God is what happens. And I'm not going to do an entire sermon on reprobates tonight, but you can look at Romans chapter 1 and there's other places that, that describe what this is talking about here. And Jesus is bearing, let's look at some of the evidence that we see right here in John chapter 8. He says, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Because they claimed that God was their father. That's what they claimed. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. He says, verse 43, Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. He said, Why don't you understand me? And then he answers himself, Because you can't hear my word. And when he says hear, obviously it doesn't mean audibly. Audibly they can hear it. But hearing, often in the Bible, what, normally when you see that word hearing in the Bible, it's talking about understanding. right? They can't understand what he's saying. They can't receive what he's saying. And he's saying that, not that they don't want, he says they can't. They are unable to understand what he's saying. They cannot comprehend what he's saying because they're children of the devil. Because they're, they, they, they are reprobate. Um, <clears throat> First John chapter 5 verse 1 says whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments so in 1 John he's explaining you know because Jesus is explaining to him here in John 8 that, um, that he knows that they're Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. And um, he says, but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. And um, it says, if God were your father, you would love me. So if they were begotten of God, they would love Jesus Christ. As 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 says, Everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. And he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And if you remember in John chapter 7, last week in verse 19, Jesus said to these people, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people are going about to kill him, these reprobates that were children of the devil, that were trying to kill Jesus Christ, None of them kept the law of Moses. None of them did. Yet 1 John 5, 2 says, By this know, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And they didn't love God. They didn't love the children of God. They actually hated him. And it's evident because Jesus even said that they don't keep the law. But um, they could not understand what Jesus was saying even if they wanted to. Because they were reprobate, because they were children of the devil. And that's an important point to remember. Um, John 8 is, is, a, is a great place where he explains this. Like I said, Romans chapter 1, this concept is taught in other places. But um, once a person is a child of the devil, they can no longer have a different father. That's who they are. They are they're damned from, that, from, from the moment they make that, that, that decision to just, just ultimately reject God and follow Satan. Unfortunately, that people get to that point. And, and they're rejected and now they cannot. The reason why they can't understand is because all they need to do to be saved is believe. And if they were able to understand, it would be possible for them to believe. But if they can't understand it, then there's no way they can believe. 
And God hardens their heart to where he gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And, and, and that's why we have some of these filthy perverts that are out there today is because they're children of the devil. They're not children of God. And they're never going to be children of God. They're children of the devil. And they cannot, they cannot hear and understand what Jesus is saying. And um, <clears throat> verse number 45 says, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, first of all, he asked the question, which of you convinceth me of sin? Meaning, which of you can prove that I'm a sinner? Where have I sinned? None of them can convince him of sin. He has not done any sin. He's perfect. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. But then he says, he that is of God, that is born of God, is, that has come from God, heareth God's words. That's why those that are saved can understand the Bible. And normally, well, not normally, it's in, in every case, when you're not, uh, an unsaved person cannot understand God's words. They can't know the Bible because they're not of God. They're not born of God. They're not born again. He says, ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. You, you don't understand God's words until you become born again. When first you take that, that, that step of, of putting your faith on Christ, that's when you're born again. Then you start to understand. I remember trying to read the Bible when I was younger. I didn't understand a lick of it. I didn't understand any of it. It was confusing. It didn't make any sense. But I'll tell you what, after I got saved, you open up that book, it's, you're illuminated. You can understand. It's a spiritual book. It's God's words. You know, Jesus Christ said, He is the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. Another shepherd will they not follow. He said, you know, we're not going to be deceived. I'm not just going to be deceived by some, by some false book, by some false Bible, some false religion, some false teacher. I hear the voice of Jesus. I hear his words. I can read this book and understand it because I'm born of God. I'm born again. And if you're saved today, you can do the exact same thing. But those people who are not saved, they don't understand this. And this is why we need to be careful who we get our doctrine from. Now, you may not be stepping foot in some, you know, Pentecostal church or some Mormon church or some, you know, whatever, some of these other Jehovah's Witness church or whatever. You may not step foot in them, but it's not just learning from church. Be careful about the books that you read. Because oftentimes you go to a library or, or you go to the bookstore and you'll find a book. And, oh, man, this looks like an interesting title. It's a subject I'm interested in. I want to learn about this. But you don't know anything about the author. If you're reading a book written by someone who's not saved, they're not going to be telling you the truth. They're not going to understand the Bible. They, how are they going to expound God's word unto you if they're not even saved? They cannot understand God's word. So, you know, I'm not a big fan of reading, of reading you know, Christian literature as it is. And that's the biggest reason why. But if you are going to read stuff, I'm, you know, I'm not saying it's a sin to read, you know, to read a book, you know, whatever, it's fine. But just make sure you know who the author is and that they have a testimony of salvation that's correct, that's accurate. If you're going to even want to learn anything from them. And even then, they may not be teaching the truth, but at least you know that they can, they have the ability to understand God's word. As opposed to people who aren't even saved. No reason to read their books. If you know that someone's a heretic, they, don't, they, don't, they believe wrong about salvation, don't even bother reading their garbage because all it's going to do is confuse you. They're going to have some weird doctrine, some messed up understanding of the Bible because they're not saved and it could twist your mind around. So I would just stay away from that junk. But, um, and this is also one of, the, one of the ways that I use and I think that we could use to help us understand if someone even is saved. Um, just the fact that he says that he that is of God heareth God's words. When you talk to someone and you're bringing up basic biblical concepts and you have the Bible in front of you and you can say, look, oh, for example, that the, the flood was a worldwide flood, right? All the creatures of the earth were destroyed and you start showing people and, you know, and they're just like, no, I don't believe that. And just, you know, like, like I think it was just in that location. Then you start showing the verses. Well, it says every hill under heaven was covered. It says all the mountains were covered. Okay, how could all the mountains be covered if the water didn't go everywhere? Because as soon as it goes over the, the highest peak, guess what happens? It starts to flow on the other side. And if it's still covered, it's going to cover everything. 
You know, but you start showing them things like that, and they're like, oh, no, I don't get it. Then you start showing them something else in the Bible, right? Some other simple, basic truth. You start, you open up a scripture, and you start just, just, just explaining real simple, basic doctrine. Oh, maybe Jesus was born of a virgin, right? And you start showing them that some people, oh, no, I don't, you know. If they, if they lack this understanding, if they're not getting it, and they can't see it, and it's, it's plain. Now, I'm not talking about some of the darker you know, harder to understand things like, you know, maybe like future prophecy or things like that. But just, I mean, things are just spelled out, real black and white. You know, there, there's not much room for argument at all that, that this is what it says. When people don't even get that and just want to argue with you about it and everything else and you're showing it to them, that's when I start to question their salvation. Um, because they should know that they should be able to see these things and know them. It's, it's one thing to be wrong. Like, no one's going to be right about everything. And some people don't know the Bible very well. And that's why I say, you know, it's not just because they believe wrong about something, but if you actually show it to them and they're still just not getting it and they're just, just, it just goes like right over their head, they're probably not saved. I mean, you know, obviously you're not the judge of that, but I would use that as a red flag to, to be focused on giving the gospel. I need to, I need to hurry up here because I see I'm running real short on time. Back to this. Um, so we're still in the same story. He says, Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil. Now was Jesus a Samaritan? No. Not at all. He was of the tribe of Judah. Right? Jesus was in the kingly line. He was a Jew. He was not a Samaritan. He was not part of the northern tribe of, of, of Israel that got mingled in with the heathen. He was not a Samaritan. But then it says, and has a devil. So now they're accusing him, like, say we not well that you have a devil, that he is of Satan. Verse number 49, Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Now, I want to stop real quick because maybe you weren't convinced from the earlier verses that we read about these people being reprobate. Maybe that wasn't enough. Maybe when he says, well, you can't hear my words. Maybe you're, you're saying, well, I don't know. You know, I don't think that's exactly what that means. Well, look at what they did right here. They accused him of having a devil. Flip, if you would. Keep your finger in John 8. We're coming right back here. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter number 3. We're going to see something real interesting here. This, is, this, this ought to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that these people were reprobate. Mark chapter 3. And verse number 28. Mark 3, 28. Jesus Christ said, Verily, ver verily I say unto you, All sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. Verse 29, Mark 3, 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. So right here we see blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is something that can never be forgiven. He says, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you don't get forgiveness. Okay? Now, obviously, this is something that happens before a person can ever get saved. Because once you're saved, you have everlasting life. You can't lose that salvation. So this is something that a person can do prior to getting saved, is blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And, and Jesus says, if you do this, you don't have forgiveness. Again, this is something you could do just like tampering with God's word, as it says in the last chapter of Revelation, that it says that if any man add unto these words, I shall add unto him the plagues that are written therein. And if anyone remove the words of the prophecy of this book, I shall remove his name out of the book of life. And, uh, you know, and, and, and basically is saying that they can't be saved. That's one of the things you can do to make sure to seal your fate that you can never get saved. Well, just like that is, you can also blaspheme the Holy Ghost. The next verse explains what that means of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. This is not some mysterious thing that we can't understand. Verse number 30 says, because, because they said, so why would they blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Like, what is it that they're in danger of? Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. In this story, they said that Jesus Christ had a devil. That he was of the devil. That he was of Satan. That's where he explains, you know, can Satan cast out Satan? The house divided can't stand. You know, he explains that he's not of the devil. But 
this is how they blasphemed the Holy Ghost is when they said that Jesus Christ is of the devil. Because that's a pretty bold statement to make. These people saw Jesus Christ performing these miracles and raising the dead and healing the sick and walking on water, turning water on, all the great things that he did. And they're saying that's of the devil. The exact opposite of where he's from. He's from God. They're saying he's of the devil. And what did they say to him here? In John chapter 8, flip back to John 8, verse 48, and he says, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? They blasphemed the Holy Ghost by saying that Jesus Christ had a devil. This is what they believed. This is why they're a reprobate. They couldn't hear his words. Because once you have never forgiveness, God makes sure that you, you are no longer capable of even putting your faith on Christ. Because if they were to do that, then they would have to be saved according to Scripture. But if they have never forgiveness, it's impossible for them to hear. It's impossible for them to understand. It's impossible for them to ever receive forgiveness by putting their faith on Christ. They can't do it. Their heart has been hardened. They've been given up and given over to a reprobate mind. They said he had a devil. And that's what they believed. And in, in Mark chapter 3 says, that's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. So if the other earlier verses didn't convince you, hopefully that will. We're almost done. I got one more major point to make in this sermon. I said I was going to get back to it. The Bible says, um, in verse 51, I'll reread that. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. See, they reiterate. Before they ask the question, he says, they, now we know that you have a devil. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Right to Jesus' face. We know you have a devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets... Abraham is dead and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? <clears throat> now, what they're saying here isn't even true. And I'll just read this for you. You don't have to turn there. In Mark 12, verse 26, the Bible says, And as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. And this was to the Sadducees who didn't believe in a resurrection. So Jesus Christ said that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive because God's not the God of the dead. But these people are saying, look, Abraham is dead. The prophets are dead. And who are you? Right? And they're saying they're dead. First of all, they're wrong because they weren't dead. They were alive. Jesus answers them, verse 54, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. <clears throat> We just saw, I read for you in Mark chapter 12, how to disprove why they said when the, the prophets were dead, Abraham was dead, that Jesus said they were alive. And you might not have caught this, but he said, um, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him? The, the, the reference that he's using to explain that that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are still alive, that they're, that they're not, he's not the God of the dead. The reference he was using to prove that to them was from Exodus. And he says, and it's when Moses, when God spake unto Moses in the burning bush. It's a real familiar story. We all know that, right? That is when he's referring to that. Now, turn if you would to Exodus 3. It's the last place we're going to turn because I want you to see this. We're going to go and look at that story now. 
The same story that proves that, that what these people were saying to him was false, that they're not dead. Exodus chapter 3 in the burning bush. I want you to see this. Hopefully I could get this. I was trying to explain this to my wife when I, show, when I, when I showed her last night what I was going to be preaching about today. And um, I, I was kind of fumbling with my words a little bit. I didn't explain it really clear. But, but, but pay attention. I know, I know we've been here for a while. It's kind of a long sermon. But I, I really want to drive this last point home because it's really neat. This is really cool. And, and you'll appreciate this when we get to the end of this. Proving that, that the prophets were still alive came from Mark 12, where he says that he referenced the Moses in the burning bush. Exodus 3.13, look down at the verse if you would. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. That is that verse that he says, the God, the, you know, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. Jesus used that to explain that they're still alive. Because he's not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. These, these Jews, these reprobates were saying that, that you know, the prophets were dead, Abraham was dead. But this is also the same passage that, that, Moses, that God revealed himself unto Moses and his name was I Am. Tell them, I Am hath sent you. What did Jesus say at the end here of verse 58 of John 8? He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I Am. Remember I told you to pay attention to that earlier in the passages. Jesus says, I Am. He is God in the flesh, and that's what he's claiming to be. They understand the reference. They understand when he says, before Abraham was, I am. That's why they picked up stones to kill him, because it enraged him. The fact that he would say that he is God in the flesh, walking around on this earth. Jesus said in John 8, 24, we already read this. I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he. I am who? I am. I am he. I am from Exodus 3. John 8, 28 says, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He. When He's crucified on that cross, and what did the, what did the Roman soldiers say? Truly this was the Son of God. He was lifted up. They knew that it was Him. I am. Jesus Christ knew who He was. He didn't make any bones about it. He, didn't, he wasn't mysterious about it. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. And the way that this, this all ties together is just, is just amazing. Now, I'm gonna, in the last point, remember that Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. This is why people that believe in another Jesus are not saved. Sometimes you go out soul winning and you'll talk to a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. Right? People who do not believe that Jesus is the I am. They do not believe I am he like Jesus Christ said. They believe he is just the son of God. They don't believe he was the I am that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. They don't believe that. But sometimes they'll say, oh, it's just by faith. And you say, well, how come a person is not saved then if they say they just believe in Jesus by faith alone? Because they don't believe I am he. They don't believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God and he was God in the flesh. It is very important. It's critical. You cannot put your faith on Jesus. It's a different Jesus if you're believing in someone who is not the I am of the Bible. It is very important. It's crucial for people to understand that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He's not just some man. He's not just some prophet. He's not just some teacher. He is the deity of Christ is very real. You have to believe that to be saved. Jesus Christ said, if you don't believe that I am he, you're going to die in your sins. Such an amazing chapter. I love the book of John. It, John just goes through over and over again the deity of Christ. You could prove it up and down every other way. And, and the way that everything fits together here, to me, it just as amazes me. The fact that they were bringing up that the prophets were dead. 
Jesus already made the reference back to Moses in the burning bush, proving that they're not dead, which is also how he wraps it up with saying that before Abraham was, I am. Same exact reference to the burning bush. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your powerful words. God, there's so much to, to learn here, and there's stuff that we even had to skip over, God, but um, I thank you for, for revealing so much truth unto us, God. I pray that you would please just help us to learn more. Help us to study our Bibles. Lord, help us to be disciples of yours, dear Lord, that, that we can truly be made free, that we can be made free of the sins that we're struggling with, that we won't be brought again under the bondage of, of any of the sins of this world, dear Lord, but we could just continue to serve you and to glorify your name, dear God. I pray that you would please just bless everyone here tonight. Bless us as we go our separate ways, dear Lord. Help us to be